Welcome to Fulton Free Will this morning. Glad you're with us in service today. It's good to be back. Had a few days off and uh, did a whole lot of nothing. And so it was good, And uh, uh, but it's good to be back with you today. And so let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for the opportunity, Lord, to be back in your house today. Uh, as always, to gather together with your people to honor you and to sing praises to you and to hear from your word and uh, Lord, we pray today that your Holy Spirit would come and meet with us, and we ask, Lord, that uh, if there is uh, one person here, Lord, who needs salvation, uh, that this would be the day that they commit themselves to you, that they repent of sin and place their faith in Christ. And Lord, we pray today if there is one who needs encouragement, that you would encourage their heart. If there is one who has drifted away, Lord, may they come home today. Uh, to you. And so, Lord, we just give this service over to you and pray that you be honored and glorified in it all. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning. And praise the Lord for the sunshine. (laughs) Um, Just a few announcements. Miss Amy is not here, but she will still be taking donations for the food bags. We plan on doing them, I think, next weekend. We got two weeks for spring break. So next weekend, and then we'll give them to the kids for the spring break week. Um, Don't forget about our Jeb Potluck lunch today following the service this morning. So it's just donations only on money. You just come in, eat, give a donation to raise money for their uh, mission trip. Also, after the lunch, if we can have some men stay after everybody's done eating, and we're going to move all the yard sale stuff over to the gym because the yard sale is this weekend. Um, And then tomorrow, for any of the ladies that can meet at 6 o'clock, we're going to come out here and try to organize and set up all the stuff and price it for this weekend, which leads me into this weekend is the yard sale. Um, Thursday, all church members are going to be invited to shop first and get the best. And then uh, Friday and Saturday, we're going to do the yard sale. Um, So you can start advertising. It's been advertising, but keep advertising that. Um, Also, don't forget, or no, next, no, not next. Saturday, March 23rd, Northeast District Women Active for Christ. It's our meeting. It's in Amory. Lunch will be provided. There's going to be no cost, and we'll leave the church at 9 o'clock in the morning. So you can start making plans for that. Um, Then our Living Proof crew that's going in March, don't forget about that, March 29th through 30th, all women that are going. I think we've already signed up, deadline and everything, but just don't forget about it. And then we're going to have a fifth Sunday praise night, March the 31st. If you want to be a part of that, see Brother Nathan over here. Um, And then we're going to have a friend day, April the 14th, so bring a friend to church. Can you imagine if everybody in here brought one friend? We'd be packed out. So um, I encourage you to bring somebody. And then don't forget about our church count starting in June, um, pre-K through 12th grade. And each week is individually, so 7th through 12th will go one week, 4 through 6 the next, 1 through 3, and then pre-K and K. So if you want to sign up for that, there's early bird specials. You get a cheaper price. Go ahead and sign up, and you can see Belinda Deal if you you have questions on that. All right, if you will, go ahead and stand as our praise team comes. Oh 
give you one other announcement. Joy Group, we're going to go eat in Smithville, or where we always go, this Thursday. We'll say 6 o'clock. If that doesn't work, uh, somebody just let me know. Uh, we'll take the van if anybody needs to. So just put that on your calendar, if you would, this Thursday at 6. Isn't it good to be outside? Amen. Uh, let's have our ushers come forward, and we will receive our morning tithes and offerings. Let's pray. Father God, we do again thank you so much for the opportunity to be in your house today. Thank you for your blessings to us. Thank you for how you provide for us each and every day. And Lord, we just thank you for uh, being able to gather together once again, Lord, through a very wet week. And uh, we just praise you for the good God that you are. And uh, Lord, we just pray now that you will bless this offering. Use it for your glory, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand once more with us as we sing hymn 294, My Savior's Love. Stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned I clean. Oh, how wonderful and my soul shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows, he prayed not my will but thine. He had no tears for his own. Drops of blood for mine. Oh, how marvelous! Oh, how wonderful! And my soul shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous! Oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows. He Footsteps of Jesus. That's hymn 607 in your hymnal.
church that seeks to serve you. Um, Lord, we want to thank you for a church that is um, planning to send youth out on mission work to fulfill your great commission, um, Lord, to the uttermost parts of the world. Lord, we want to thank you for your son Jesus and what he's done for us, dying on the cross so that we can have that relationship and we can share that good news with others. Lord, we want to thank you this morning. Lord, you've been so good to bless us, Lord. Uh, we want to thank you for this community, a community that, um, that embraces you, a community um, that is thirsty for your word, and Lord, a community that is um, wide unto harvest, Lord. And I pray that the laborers in this church would be willing and ready to serve you. Lord, I just want to thank you for all that you've done for us. You are such a good, good father. And Lord, we are so many times... Um, we just fall short. But, Lord, your mercy and your grace is sufficient to carry us through anything that this life can throw at us. And we want to thank you for that. Lord, I want to pray for Brother Michael as he seeks to share with us um, out of your word in the book of James, a book of wisdom this morning. Lord, I pray that you will bestow on us your wisdom, Lord, and it, that your voice would be made known to us today. Lord, we love you, and we want to thank you for your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we are going to begin uh, looking at the book of James. So if you have your Bibles, you can be turning there. We're going to cover all of one verse today. <laughs> I'm not joking. Um, uh, John chapter 1 verse 1 is where we're going to be this morning. And I start with a statement. What you do reveals what you truly believe. What you do truly reveals what you believe. Our actions show the world, and really not just shows the world, but it shows ourselves. Uh, what it is we truly believe really about everything, right? I mean, we can say one thing. If, if we say we believe one thing, but we do something else, then we don't really believe what we, we have 
said that we believe. This morning as we have gathered together here in Fulton, um, I bring this up for a reason because of what we're looking at in St. Louis uh, today. The, you may have heard on the news, it's been kind of in different places, they're talking about it. Um, the, the leaders from the United Methodist denomination are gathered together in St. Louis. Um, they are having to decide what they should do as a denomination concerning LGBTQ issues um, such as ministers who are for gay marriage, have done gay marriages, uh, what they, what, how they should feel and do concerning people who are their clergy that are gay. Um, now, I bring this up because if you didn't know, the United Methodist is the second largest denomination in America. It is only second to the Southern Baptist. Uh, the United Methodists have over 7 million members. Um, and more than likely, we pray it doesn't, but more than likely, whatever they decide could very well likely split the denomination. And, and the way they are set up, that not only will it cause... It's just going to cause all sorts of issues they're going to have to work out if that happens. Ken Carter, who is the president of the United, Method, United Methodist Church's Council of Bishops, said, quote, I don't want to see a dismantling of the church. We can have different opinions. We can have different opinions and have a profound faith that motivates us to make a difference in the world. And let me just say, no, you can't. You can't. You cannot have different opinions on, on what is right and what is wrong. God's word is not up for debate. The Lord has made plain in his word concerning these particular issues. God's word doesn't change because God doesn't change. He makes it plain in the Old and New Testament both. I am the Lord. He says in the Old Testament, I am the Lord. I change not. His character is never going to change. Now, it is my prayer, and I have been praying this for days as I've thought about this, that the United Methodist leaders will stand firm on God's Word and that they will not bow to feelings, nor would they bow to the pressures from this world. The truth is that God's Word, at times, pierces our hearts, and yes, may hurt our feelings. God is more interested in us being holy than us feeling happy in our sin. You can quote me on that one. The United Methodist actions, hear me, will reveal what they truly believe. As we go into the book of James, we need to know right up front that James is going to show us that how we live will reveal what we truly believe. He's going to expose all of us. Um, now, James, when we think about the book of James, it's, he, he covers a variety of topics, things like test, the testing of our faith, showing favoritism, taming the tongue, praying for the sick, and many other topics. And so what I want to do this morning is, as always, when we start a new book, uh, in the scriptures, I, I like to give a little bit of background information about the book and about the person who wrote the book uh, because I think it, it gives us a better understanding that when we go into the book, we, we kind of get the mindset of what the author was thinking, who he was writing to, and those kinds of things. And so I'm going to go ahead and read James 1.1, and we're going to come back to James 1.1 here in just a little bit uh, because there's something in verse 1 that gives us identity of the author. It tells us about who he's writing to. It tells us what his perspective is of how he's going to write this letter that he wrote, like what his mentality was. Um, and so we're going to come back to it, but I want to go ahead and just read James 1, 1. He says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. And so let's look uh, let's just look at some things about the book of James. So James is known, there's all sorts of, uh, it's interesting how books of the Bible get these little phrases to try to describe what they are. Um, I can remember years ago, the first, really about the first time I heard about James, um, I want to say we did a, a study, 
probably in our teen Sunday school class at Lowell Chapel, if I'm remembering right. Um, but, uh, but I do remember being at Lowell Chapel and hearing the phrase that James is known as the gospel in blue jeans. And, and I thought, well, that's an interesting way of putting things. And so, uh, but also James is kind of, I read, I came across this one, that it's kind of the Proverbs of the New Testament. Um, it reminds us as Christians how we are to, to live. And like Proverbs, if you ever read through Proverbs, you know it's, it's kind of hard to outline Proverbs because it just kind of goes here, there, and everywhere. James is somewhat like that. It's only five chapters, but he kind of goes from this topic to this topic to this topic and that kind of thing. And so it's in that way, it's a little, you can't just uh, pick out one theme um, that's throughout the whole book. So the dating, let's look at the date for the book of James. Um, without getting into all the details and looking into all the internal uh, and external evidence for uh, dating the book, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you that conservatively, uh, the book can be dated between about A.D. 46 to A.D. 49. It's one of the earlier books that we have of the New Testament in its original form. This would be just under 20 years after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. And you think, wow, 20 years from, from the time of Jesus' crucifixion to the first original writing of James, that's not a long time. It's not a long time. And when you compare ancient manuscripts that we've done uh, on Wednesday nights, probably a year or so ago now, but when you compare um, ancient manuscripts of when the original was made compared to, say, when the first copy was made, any, there are some out there that could be up to a thousand years from the original copy to the first, first uh, copy, or from the original manuscript to the first copy. So uh, it's very close. Uh, you don't have to worry about it being accurate or anything like that. Uh, so that's the date, anywhere 46 to 49. Now the author, we see in verse 1, we are told that it is James. Well, that's nice. Well, the question is, which James? Because James was a very common name in first century. Uh, Jacob or James, as it would be known. And so which James are we talking about? Now, if you read through the New Testament, you know that there are several Jameses that are mentioned. Uh, you can narrow it down to three, but really when you even narrow it down to the three, you can actually get a pretty likelihood that it's only one possible answer to the book of James as to who the author is. But up to, just for argument's sake, we'll look at three of those. Uh, taking, I got some of this info from the Randall House commentary because they did a really good job of, of uh, explaining these things. So the first James that would be a possibility would have been James, the son of Zebedee, who was the brother of John. He was a part of the inner circle of the disciples. He ranks high among the early followers of Jesus. The only problem is... Uh, James, uh, this particular James was martyred in A.D. 44. And if it's dated between 46 and 49, you see the problem, right? So because in Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it says, At that time Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And we date that to around A.D. 44. So secondly would be James, the son of Alphaeus. He is listed as an apostle, but other than being listed as an apostle, there's no other mention of him really in the New Testament other than in the lists that he's an apostle. So it's very doubtful that he would be the author. And that brings us to the third and final one, which is more than likely, like 99% probably sure, it is James, the brother of Jesus. Uh, James, who would technically be the half-brother of Jesus. They had the same mother. And so as we look at James, the half-brother of Jesus, uh, we're gonna, uh, it's not just about looking at him. There's some things that we're going to draw out for our own lives as we look at this man by the name of James. Um, first of all is James, uh, during Jesus' earthly ministry, James opposed Jesus as Messiah uh, before the resurrection. Listen to John chapter 7, verses 3 through 5. So his brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may seek the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. 
If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. Now, James only believed that Jesus was Messiah, that he was the Savior, that he was Lord after the resurrection because Jesus appeared to James. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Now, let me just say this about the word appeared. Uh, the word appeared doesn't mean like he showed up like a ghost and that like they could put their hand through him and, and all those kinds of things. When it says that he appeared, he literally could appear in this room, but he would be tangible, right? And so they could touch him and feel him and know that he was real. This is why we go back to the fact that after the resurrection, we're, we're told that, remember he told Thomas, touch my hands, touch my side, feel that I'm real. This is why he ate with them, so that he could prove to them that he really was physically resurrected from the dead and he wasn't some spirit or some ghost. And so after that, James believed. And by A.D. 50, James was one of the leading uh, members of the church in Jerusalem. We know this by the fact of what takes place in Acts chapter 15. You can go back and read that. We've been looking at Acts on Sunday nights, and so we've already looked through Acts 15. Um, and we'll continue Acts tonight, by the way. So really good stuff in Acts tonight, so come back. But um, uh, So we think about leadership. But, uh, but uh, in Acts 15, we see... Uh, uh, James taking on this prominent leadership role. The Apostle Paul stated that James was a pillar of the church like Peter and John. We see this in Galatians chapter 2 as, Peter, or as uh, Paul is reminiscing back about his early days as a believer. One of the people that he went and saw was James. So then there's two other factors that point to James, the brother of Jesus being the author um, the commentary points out the similarities between the book of James and James's speech in Acts 15, very similar things. And then secondly, the Jewishness of the book of James, which matches the ministry of James. So that just kind of makes sense. One commentary noted, it said, so when one compares James's life and ministry with how the book is written, it draws us to the conclusion that the brother of Jesus is the author. And so when you put all of those things together, you kind of keep adding them all up, it brings you to the conclusion that James, the half-brother of Jesus, is the author. His audience, uh, as we see, uh, that in verse 1, says that he is writing to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. So who in the world is he writing to? Well, very simply, he was writing to Jewish Christians who were outside of Palestine at the time. Um, and so that's who he is writing to. So that's kind of the author, that's the date, that's the audience. Now I want us to look a little deeper at the author himself, the person, James. And as we do, we're going to take away some things for our own lives, I believe. Uh, I think, especially as we think about him making that uh, statement that he's James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to hone in on that word servant this morning. So let's look at James the person. So he opens with that statement that he is a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, of course, the question is why would he use that type of an opening? Why would he make that statement? James was not an apostle. He was a pastor. He was a leader. Uh, at the church in Jerusalem. He used this term servant to show how he was going to be addressing his audience. He wasn't coming to them like the Apostle Paul would. He wasn't coming to them like the Apostle Peter would. They're coming at them with, like, with apostolic authority. James is coming as a servant. Even though he's a leader... He's coming as a servant. And so he says, I want to talk to you today as a servant to a servant about serving our Lord Jesus. And that's what I'm coming to you today. It's just a servant to servants on how we can serve our Lord. Now, when he says of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, by using that particular phrase... He is putting Jesus, God the Son, equal with God the Father. Because why? They are. One God, 
three divine persons in the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so he's equating the Father with the Son. Now, let's focus in real quick for a little while on this word servant. Uh, the word servant in Hebrew is ebed, and in Greek is doulos. And from those words we get servant, slave, and bondservant. Now, that's, those are important words. I do have a, a quote here that I wanted to read out of the uh, preface of my Bible. If you've never read the preface of your Bible, I highly recommend it. Because you can find out some really good stuff in there. I know, I know. But it's good. So as we think about this, these words, uh, servant and slave and bondservant, it says, quote, in the Old Testament times, one might enter slavery, catch this now, because so many times people want to start knocking slavery in the... Well, there's slavery in the Bible, so we can't trust the Bible and all this kind of stuff. Well, you don't understand of what was going on then. And you have to understand the context of it. So it says... Uh, one might enter slavery either voluntarily to escape poverty or to pay off a debt or involuntarily by birth, by being captured in battle, or by judicial sentence. In any of those cases, voluntary or involuntary, now guess this, protection for all in servitude in ancient Israel was provided by the Mosaic law. So you just couldn't treat someone any of the way you wanted to treat them. Mosaic law prohibited that. Just interesting note. So in New Testament times, there's a point to this, doulos is often described as a bondservant. That is, as someone bound to serve his master for a specific, usually a lengthy period of time, but also as someone who might nevertheless own property, achieve social advancement, and even be released or purchase his Freedoms. And you say, Michael, why in the world is this important? I'm glad you asked. For James, he was addressing his audience as a servant. And, and as you think about being a servant, what ser the word servant means, there's three things I want us to focus on this morning that I think applies to every single one of us who named the name Jesus. So if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a true believer, all three of these things impact our lives. Number one, as he thinks about being a slave, it shows his humility as a servant. We often speak of humility in our relationship with the Lord. You, you know me, I bring this up all the time, that we have to remain humble people. We remain humble because we know that it is only by God's grace that we're saved. Right? That it's nothing in ourselves it's not because we were good. It's not because we were lovely. It's not because of any of those things. It is by His grace that we're saved. We remain humble because we know that it is only by His grace that we're able to live for Him. Again, it's nothing in ourselves. It's not because we're strong mentally or physically or psychologically or whatever. It's, it's not because of, of all those things. It is by His grace that we live for Him. We remain humble because our Lord, Jesus Christ, came as a humble servant. Philippians 2 makes it plain that He humbled Himself so much so that He died on the cross. And so as we think about living our lives, we are to live humble, servant-like lives because we understand who we are by God's grace. So we live with humility. Secondly, we see that this shows his submission. Now, even though James's submission was on a volunteer basis... It was still submission. It was him submitting himself to God. This is why he says in uh, chapter 4, verse 7, he says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Just do it. And so that begs the question for us. Have we submitted to God? Have we submitted to Him in salvation? 
Have we submitted to Him where we've come to the place where we realize that we are a sinner in need of a Savior and that Jesus Christ is the only Savior? And have we humbled ourselves to Him to say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner and I need You to forgive me of that sin and I need to place my faith in You, Jesus Christ, to save me from my sin? That's submission. Have we submitted to Him not just as Savior, but have we submitted to Him as Lord? Where we say, Lord, where we say, Jesus, you are in charge of me. I no longer am in charge of myself. I commit myself totally, fully, everything to you. James had. Or do we have that, when we think about submitting ourselves to Him, the, the, the question is, have we, do we give Him 50%? Do we, do we give Him 90%? Do we give Him 100%? Do, do we have that one thing that, that we just say, well, yeah, I'll give all of this to you, Lord, but, but this one little thing over here, I, I've got to keep for me. I'm going to compartmentalize my relationship with God so that I can keep this one little thing for me. If that's the case, then you haven't submitted. Because God calls for us to submit totally, fully, 100% to Him. Third... This shows that he, James, knew with whom he belonged to. James understood, again, that he no longer belonged to himself, that he belonged to Jesus Christ. And he knew that he had been bought, how? By the precious blood of Jesus. I remind us of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 and 20. Or do you not know? that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. You are not your own. I am not my own. If I, have, if I have repented of sin, I've placed my faith in Jesus Christ to make Him Savior and Lord. I no longer belong to me, but I belong to Him, and I'm no, I'm no longer my own. Because I have been bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Now, as you think about James, he was his half-brother. He watched him grow up. He grew up with him. And he didn't believe until after the resurrection, right? But James, after the resurrection, bowed the knee to Jesus Christ. Mary, his very own mother, bowed the knee to Jesus Christ. Joseph, his stepdad, bowed the knee to Jesus. They submitted themselves. They, they knew with whom they belong. Every person that comes to Jesus Christ must, in humility, bow the knee to Jesus. Because bowing the knee, is, it's showing us, uh, if, if, whether you want to think of it in a physical way or, or, or metaphor, is, I think more physical, but we, when we humble ourselves, we are, we are saying, Lord, we recognize that you are king. You're the king. Have you bowed the knee? And confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Philippians chapter 2. 
9 through 11 says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee will bow. Every knee. From the lowliest homeless person to the king of the world will eventually bow the knee. And you will either bow the knee because you are his servant or you will bow the knee in judgment. But you will bow the knee. And it doesn't matter who it is. Again, you think about, when you think about all the people in this world and uh, all the people that we put on pedestals. Oh, the people we put on pedestals. I don't understand it. But we put so different, various people on pedestals and we say, wow, these people, they're important. And then you look at politicians all around the world and there's kings of countries. And yet... There's a day coming, if they don't do it now, but there is a day coming when every single one of them will bow the knee and admit that Jesus Christ is King. I am thankful that I have already bowed the knee. And that when I face Him, I will not bow the knee in judgment but I will bow the knee because he is my king and I am his servant. And by his grace, I get to serve him. Not only in this life, but in the life to come. James was a humble servant who submitted himself completely to Jesus Christ. There is no doubt about it. When you look at who James was before resurrection, He just didn't believe. But after the resurrection, everything changed. So are you that servant? Are you the servant of the Lord Jesus? I pray you are today. And if you're not, I hope that before this day ends, that you will submit yourself to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Christian, my encouragement to us is don't compartmentalize your life. Don't try to keep something, whatever that thing is, don't try to keep that thing for yourself because in doing so, you're not totally submitting to him. My encouragement to us is submit everything to him completely, totally, 100%. Because it is then we will serve him probably like we've never served him before. So let me get you to stand for just a moment. Let me get you to bow your heads just for a second. As I look around the room, uh, probably the majority here would say you've already bowed the knee. And I am thankful for that. That you've already bowed the knee and said, I have I have committed my life to Christ, and He is my Savior and He's my Lord, and I know my sins are forgiven. But my question to us is this morning, believer, have you allowed something back into your life? Or maybe you just allowed something into your life that you know is not pleasing to Him.
that if you actually, if, if Jesus were to appear here and you were the only one in the room and you're getting ready to have a conversation with Jesus face to face, you know that that one thing would be the one thing that was on your mind. You know why? Because you already know that Jesus knows the one thing. So my question is, are you willing to repent of that one thing that you've been holding on to and lay that at the Savior's feet so that you may serve Him better, so that you may love Him better? That can be an attitude, it can be an action, it can be a habit, it can be all sorts of things. My question to us is, is there something that I've just been holding on to and I know I need to get rid of it? If that's you this morning, without anyone looking around, just between you and the Lord, just say, Michael, that's me. There's, there's something in my life and I need to repent of it and I need to lay that at Jesus' feet today. I just want to pray for you. Can I get you to slip your hand up just so I know who I'm praying for? Real quick. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you for your honesty. As I get ready to pray, if you need to come to the altar and, and kneel in humble submission to the Lord, then I invite you to come. I invite you to come. And surrender that to Him. I know you can do it where you stand, and ain't nobody going to think anything less of you. No one's going to go, oh, why are they going to the altar? It's the fact that they, there's something they just need to talk to the Lord about. Please do not let pride stop you from coming if you know you need to come. If you need to come this morning and surrender that to Christ, I invite you to come as I pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day and your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the great example in your servant, James. And Father, I pray for all of us here today that you would help us to be those humble, submitted servants of the Lord Jesus. Father, I pray for those that have lifted hands today that, Lord, that there's just something in their life, whatever that is, that there's, there's something that they need to confess. And so, Lord, I pray today that, that as, as they're standing here and as they're praying, and I pray, Lord, that, that they would truly confess that to you today. And, Lord, we thank you for the great promise in your word that if we will confess our sin, that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, Lord, I pray that as we work our way through the book of James, Lord, that you would show us your greatness. Show us, Lord, how we can live for you and how we can be great servants of yours. Lord, just thank you so much for this day and your blessings. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, for being with us today, if we can help in any way after service, by all means, let us know. Um, hope you can stay and eat. There is plenty of food down in the Family Life Center. It's a Jeb project. You got to eat lunch somewhere, right? If you didn't cook, you got to eat. And uh, so instead of McDonald's and Burger King, go to the Family Life Center, right? And uh, um, there's some good food down there. I've already seen it and smelled it. And so uh, we hope you can stay for. That. Don't forget, um, uh, tonight we'll be continuing in the book of Acts, and hope you can come back for that. All right. I'm going to ask Steve Wood if he'll close us in prayer, please.